Many people, including myself, have been disappointed by the most recent Pokemon entries. While not being outright bad, they've definitely left a lot of people feeling... dissatisfied. I've almost experienced a Groundhog's Day type loop when it comes to the most recent Pokemon game. I'll play it, have a solid amount of fun, and after I become champion, I'll just put the game down without really thinking about it, and retrospectively view the game as underwhelming. Even though these newer games are incredibly similar to their predecessors both mechanically and structurally, upon closer examination, the fundamental differences between the way these games were designed becomes apparent. I'm going to explain what made the early Pokemon games special to so many people by establishing three core elements that they all excelled at, show where these newer games have failed to live up to their predecessors in those elements, and provide tangible solutions that would improve the quality of the games. The core appeal of these games is quite literally on the front of the box. The Pokémon, and the connection that players form with them. They're the link between the player and the fictional world, and by attaching mythical elements to real-life inspirations, people are able to connect with them in the same way someone could connect to a pet. For example, take your starter Pokémon. There's a reason that Sceptile, Charizard, or Typhlosion are so many people's favorites. Seeing a Pokémon grow throughout your entire journey and win pivotal battles creates a bond between yourself and the sprite. And due to the game's complex type system, you need other Pokémon that fill out your weaknesses and complement each other. These other Pokémon might evolve, or they may already be as strong as they're going to be. Variety in appearance, role, typing, and personality is what makes these Pokémon unique, and the freedom to catch whatever you want allows the player to customize and construct a team as they desire. The Pokémon are what give the player the ability to become stronger, so their growth is directly connected with the protagonists. Each of your six Pokémon should be used in some way, and they can all be helpful towards your progression. This connection to the Pokémon is why some players enjoy Nuzlocke so much. The severe consequence of having your Pokémon permanently die causes people to become far more attached to the monsters, and the increased difficulty makes victory feel much more satisfying. The constant increase in strength exhibited by the Pokémon and yourself showcases how growth through gameplay should be the main force driving these games forward. The formula for Pokémon games has always been the same. You grow up in a tiny town, pick a starter Pokémon, cop a Pokédex, and uncover a region as you beat tough gym leaders and eventually become the champion. As you defeat more Pokémon and trainers, your own Mons gain experience, allowing them to get better stats, learn more moves, and evolve into even more powerful Pokémon. It's gratifying to see your little baby chicken that scratches enemies turn into a fighting machine that punches things really hard. And then we're gonna clap him! Oh! And in a way, your starter Pokémon is analogous to your own growth as a trainer. What starts off as a cute but competent threat turns into a dominant force capable of tearing up weaker fighters. If you were to go back and fight the trainers and bosses that gave you trouble in the beginning of the game after becoming champion, you'd be able to flatten them without a second thought. This is the type of growth that makes RPGs inherently satisfying, and Pokémon games were great at it. They provided the player with enough roadblocks and difficult fights to incentivize training, without being overbearing or tedious. There's a reason so many players still remember Whitney's Miltank, Claire's Kingdra, or the fight with Red. Losing a close battle just to return and get the edge because you came prepared with a new strategy or your Pokémon got a little stronger led to memorable moments, which also enhanced the connection you felt with your party of six. The final component of a great Pokémon game is exploration. Uncovering a new region and learning about the lore and history of the world is where these games are the most unique from one another. The main towns and cities were connected by routes, and new ways to visit each area would slowly become available to the player as the region began to resemble a spider's web. Because routes were the vehicle for exploration, it's important that they were varied and expansive. They gave the player enough breathing room to be enjoyable to traverse, while remaining linear enough to give the game a clear sense of direction. Plenty of trainers filled up the routes, allowing the player to get stronger and grow closer with their Pokémon through battling. There would also be secrets hidden behind bodies of water, bike slopes, or rock walls. And although HMs were handled poorly, they allowed the world to expand almost like a Metroidvania. After getting an upgrade, it's satisfying to go back to an area that you were originally frustrated by and be rewarded with cool new areas, Pokémon, or items. In this way, exploration fed back into the progression that made these games so addictive and rewarding and made the world seem deeper and more believable. 
And it's entirely possible that players wouldn't even find areas like the Fuego Ironworks or Pacific Log Town, which makes discovering them more impactful and memorable. Secrets like these inspired the player to explore and continue wondering about what else the region may have to offer. This exploration also carried into the towns and cities. Certain NPCs could reveal interesting information about the history of the region, or trade Pokémon that would otherwise be difficult to obtain. And after the game was beaten, entirely new areas could be explored that provided the player with even more content. You could solve incredibly complex puzzles using a different language to catch ancient golems, or explore a cave that houses the living experiment that had been foreshadowed throughout the game. There was always enough context for the player to understand the world, but certain pieces of information were withheld to maintain a strong sense of mystery and secrecy. This is why you can see so many fans speculating on the origin and purpose of some of these areas in Pokémon over a decade later. Exploration is actually what made Pokémon GO successful. GO wasn't popular because of its gym battling mechanics or the novelty of flicking a Pokéball. It was a hit because it brought the same sense of exploration that these games capture so well into the real world. Over the summer of 2016, tons of kids and teenagers were in a foreign area while on vacation, and the game's incentivization of exploring the real world gave people a reason to go on their own adventures. Plenty of people have unique and interesting memories from that game, including me, which showcases the power and memorability of exploration. All of these three main elements complemented each other to create memorable experiences that were highly replayable. While these games were by no means perfect, and I think a lot of them could have been developed or streamlined even further, they were incredibly fun and satisfying adventures in a creative and inspired world. The amount of freedom that players had in team composition, and even the orders of gyms in some instances, made them feel like they were on an adventure, and allowed the player to go at whatever pace they wanted to. Oh my days! Ha ha ha! Although the most recent Pokemon games are incredibly similar to their predecessors, mechanically and conceptually, they fail to reach the standards set by the first five generations from a design perspective. In the three core elements that I've identified, they have major shortcomings that show a lack of understanding as to what made the first few generations so much fun. These differences seem pretty subtle at first, but they have a massive effect on how you perceive the game and the world within it. While the newer games don't completely flounder in this regard, they aren't good at making you feel a connection with your Pokémon. When having strong Pokémon is completely trivialized, it's impossible to feel any gratification in growing stronger, and the absolute worst defender of this is the Mega Lucario given to you in Gen 6. Why do I have this thing? What did I do to earn it? Mega Lucario is so powerful that it can hold its own against some of the game's strongest legendaries, and you're just given one as a reward for nothing. I appreciate what Gen 7 was trying to do with the ride feature by replacing HMs, but it similarly makes you feel less connected to the game's monsters. Why do I have a Lapras? I didn't catch this thing, it doesn't have a nickname, I have absolutely no connection to it, but I'm forced to use it to progress. Modes like a me, Refresh, and Camp try to get you to care about your Pokémon more by personally engaging with them, but they're so functionally shallow that players are likely to get bored after just a few uses. A me and refresh require finding a sweet spot where your Pokémon enjoys being pet the most, but after you know that, there's nothing else to really do. Use these features too much, and your Pokémon become broken machines of war, as they're able to live on 1 HP and land critical hits more often because they… love you? Some players will completely ignore these features, as they can potentially break the game, which directly opposes the game's attempt to get you invested. The revamped EXP share also impedes on this connection. It's all too easy to just shove a Pokémon in the back of your party, hardly ever bring it out or do anything with it, and only throw it out whenever it has a favorable type matchup. And Dynamax raid battles give the player EXP candies that are so ridiculously powerful that only a couple of them can raise the Pokémon's level by a few dozen. While these tools do remove grinding, and streamline the process of creating a competitive team, the inability to turn the EXP share off in Sword and Shield means that players who are looking to connect with their Pokémon or have a challenge have to go out of their way to avoid battles and certain mechanics to not get overleveled. 
Or they could use terrible Pokemon. Like Inteleon. You were the chosen one! The result of easily having strong Pokemon is that it's hard to really get connected to the things that cause you to buy the game in the first place. But the game's nerfed difficulty doesn't only affect this relationship, it also impedes on the player's sense of progression. There are no battles to really be stumped by, and so many gym leaders are completely unmemorable because of it. X and Y are the worst games in this regard. How many of you seriously remember Ramos, or Olympia, Wolfric? I had to look those names up, and upon going back and looking at their teams, I had no recollection about anything that they had. None of the leaders in that game had more than three Pokemon, and Wolfric, the final gym leader, has a Pokemon with only three moves. The overall lower difficulty of the newer games also affects how the player progresses through the region. It's understandable that barriers exist to prevent people from getting lost, but is it necessary given how tightly these games hold your hand? Having characters tell you where to go on seven different occasions, flags that point you to where you're supposed to be, and hints that tell you exactly what to do is already enough to get players on the right track. While this may be an example that's too far in the other direction, I remember playing Pokemon Pearl for the first time and getting lost in Wayward Cave. I didn't have access to Flash, and as a kid with poor navigation skills, I got stuck to the point that the only thing I could do was reset the game. Getting lost was frustrating, but it made exploring the cave when I was well prepared incredibly rewarding, and it's telling that I can recall this memory 12 years later. Another area where the games have become easier is in your rival. Blue and Silver were great rivals because their unlikability made beating them feel super satisfying, and they provided the player with a nice checkup on their skill. Now, instead of picking the starter that has a type advantage over yours, they'll pick the starter that's at a disadvantage. And while I like that your rival has an Arc and Sword and Shield, Hop's growth centers around him regaining his confidence after he continually loses. Let me say that again. Your rival, the character that used to be a stiff test that felt satisfying to beat, has an arc exploring how terrible he is at Pokemon battles as he keeps losing to you and other trainers. When the script implies that you should be destroying him, it's hard to feel any intensity in battle or elation in victory. Beads somewhat fulfills the role of the jerk rival given his arrogance, but his teams are always incredibly underwhelming, and his monotype approach makes encounters predictable. The newer games coddle you so much that it's hard to feel any sense of satisfaction in growing stronger in both battles and exploration, because the player is never in a position of weakness to grow from. As a result, progression has to be dictated by the story instead of the gameplay, and the stories that these games tell aren't good. The plot of Sun and Moon mostly revolves around characters that aren't you, with Sword and Shield unbearably taking this a step further. The larger conflict that centers around Rose and Leon isn't made clear to the player until the very end of the game, and the plot continually insults the player's sense of adventure and agency. For example, when the player hears a thunderous noise after beating Piers, just for the problems that get solved by Leon as he tells you to continue fighting gems, the whole suspense built up inevitably leads to disappointment. In Sinnoh, a similar scenario occurs in the Candleave Library. What caused the sound? Where did it come from? You find out it was at Lake Valor, and you yourself get to go there and see the damage. Exploring this desolated lake is one of the most memorable moments in the entire series, and it culminates in a cool fight with a team admin. If this moment happened in Sword and Shield, you'd get to the lake just for Cynthia to tell you that she can handle it and that it's too dangerous for a kid to get involved. A memorable moment would then be turned into a frustrating one with no payoff, and Gen 8's insistence on railroading you to progress the game with a story, just for it to strip you of all the action, feels like a sucker punch. An over-reliance on plot really started in Gen 5, but at least that game explored some interesting ideas and had understandable characters. You understood why Anne and Guesses were doing the things that they were doing, and you saw them progressively get closer to achieving their goals. Rose, on the other hand, has an incredibly silly motivation, and we don't really see his plan progress. Why does Rose think bringing about the darkest day will help Galar with energy consumption? And where in the hell does Eternatus come from? This is the equivalent of getting to the fight with In at the end of the game, and he just has a restroom there with no explanation. In past games, we saw the villain actually progress with their plan, whereas we're just supposed to accept that Rose was pulling something together... off screen. Are the stories in these games so good that they can adequately function as a driver for progression in the same way that gameplay and difficulty did in the previous games? 
Are the character arcs and thematic depth engaging enough to justify the endless amounts of dialogue and cutscenes that bombard the player wherever they go? For me, the answer to both of those questions is an easy no, and the over-reliance on uninteresting storytelling has caused these games to cast aside the strong sense of progression that they were once great at. Exploration is the aspect that these games get the most wrong, and it's immediately apparent by the way that the regions are designed. Instead of implementing the web-like design of past locales, Unova, Alola, and Yaller feel like straight lines. Gen 5 could get away with this because the routes were still expansive, but the areas in Gen 7 and 8 often feel like corridors, which is the antithesis of exploration. While older routes had branching paths and a large amount of space to traverse, newer routes are often incredibly narrow, with any alternate path just leading to a dead end. To further illustrate this point, I'm going to take a closer look at Sinnoh's Route 214. A larger look at this route reveals that it is, in fact, quite literally a line. But upon closer examination, that's an overly simplistic analysis. There are numerous different paths for the trainer to take, nearly 10 trainers to battle, the Maniac Tunnel, and an entrance to the Sendoff Spring, an interesting area that houses a really powerful Pokemon in Diamond and Pearl. This is my redesign for the route if it was in Galar. In hindsight, maybe this is a bit dramatic, but notice the overall lack of space that the player now has in comparison to before. There's a branching path, but it just leads to a dead end, and there are hardly any trainers to battle or talk to. You could argue that this design maintains the spirit of the original, and functionally the two achieve the same purpose, but the original does a far better job of making the world feel alive and lived in. Even at their most complex, routes in the newer games still maintain a heightened sense of linearity. While Galar's Route 9 does have branching paths, the game doesn't give the player any breathing room to really move around in, and it feels incredibly gamey as a result. This is in stark contrast to the Hoenn region, where the water routes were so incredibly vast that it's possible to have water be the only thing the player sees on screen, besides themselves. This change in design philosophy is also made clear by the caves. Mount Coronet and Chargestone Cave had numerous floors, and there were tons of secrets to uncover by exploring the depths of these caverns. Vast Pony Canyon in Alola kinda serves as that game's victory road, but it's incredibly narrow and small in comparison to the expansive caves players were able to explore in earlier games. Galar has two caves, creatively called Galar Mine 1 and Galar Mine 2, and both only have one floor that is incredibly restrictive and linear. Instead of exploring a cool region, you're now just going down a boring video game level. Notice how in my Route 214 redesign, I also left out the two optional areas that players could miss entirely. Even though I criticized the ride feature, it still does allow the player to go back to places they've already been to and uncover new areas. And while locations like Ten Carat Hill and the Guardian Shrines weren't particularly memorable, at least they exist. In Sword and Shield, the only overworld ability that you unlock is the upgraded road and bike that allows you to swim. While this does streamline item usage, it also means that there are less secrets to uncover. The game has hardly any inaccessible areas that the player can go back to once they have the upgraded bike, and the few areas that players can find never lead to exciting or memorable content. Some of you may be screaming at your screen right now. But what about the wild area? While it is the best part of the game, it feels like it's about 20% of what it really should be. I'm going to elaborate on this further in the final section of the video, but it only satisfies the most basic elements of exploration. It goes to show how giving the player more room helps make a world more enjoyable to navigate, and having super powerful Pokemon that you can't catch at first does allow the player to feel a sense of progression through gameplay, at least a little bit. Other than that, however, the lack of interesting locales and content makes the area feel pretty underdeveloped and insubstantial. The post games have also been incredibly shallow in recent entries. Gen 8 asks the player to go back to the gyms just to engage in mind-numbing Dynamax battles, and has no new areas to explore after becoming champion. And outside of catching Zygarde and doing a few simplistic looker missions, X and Y had hardly any content after the credits rolled. Legendary encounters have been relegated to portals that all feel and function identically, instead of acting as a reward for exploration and curiosity. When the post-game content in the newer games is virtually non-existent, the player feels less invested in the world. When the only visually interesting location in the wild area is just a Dynamax raid den, the game is poorly incentivizing exploration. When the game constantly chides the player and tells them that they aren't important, the game isn't effectively engaging its audience. When the game stops to tell you to go to a hotel, 
Stops to tell you to go to the hotel right as you leave the building where you were told to go to the hotel. Stops to tell you to get into the hotel as you're right outside of the hotel. And then stops to tell you that you need to register at the hotel when you're inside of the hotel. It doesn't feel like a fun adventure. When the player is freely given incredibly powerful Pokémon and tons of ways to easily inflate their EXP, they feel absolutely no sense of connection to the world that they're set in or the creatures that the games are named off of. When the core mechanics are constantly dumbed down in the name of streamlining, the games feel incredibly shallow, unmemorable, unmysterious, and unimpactful. I've been complaining a lot in this video, but believe it or not, I don't think a ton has to change for these games to become significantly better. It's easy to just say that Pokemon should go open world, and while that is a natural fit for the series that I'd love to see, my suggestions aren't going to be nearly that drastic. I understand that these games are designed with children in mind, but at least offer the player more options to change the difficulty. Mario Odyssey had an assist mode that gave younger players who struggled with the game a way to see it through to the end, but it didn't force it onto more capable players. A pro mode, or something that removes all of the tutorials and handholding, would help experienced players feel like they have more agency in their adventure. One notable exception to the lowered battle difficulty of the newer games is Ultra Necrozma. This mon is insanely powerful, and the reactions many players had to it is telling of how challenging it is. I'm supposed to beat this thing?! Although this comes across as a massive difficulty spike given how simple the rest of the game is, it goes to show that difficult battles can lead to interesting and memorable moments. Having more difficulty options in terms of level scaling or enemy AI would only be a good thing, and could go a long way in making these games more replayable. Also being able to turn the EXP share off, or change the amount of Pokémon that it affects, would allow people to have more flexibility with how they experience the game. You may like the new EXP share, but all I'm asking for is more options so that the people that don't like it don't have to use it while you still can. All of these changes are pretty simple additions, and they would help the people looking for a challenge feel the sense of progression that a great RPG should, and make having strong Pokémon feel more fulfilling. I enjoy great stories and games, but I'm not sure this is the series for complex narratives. The plot should mainly act as a contextualization for the player's journey that occasionally provides cool moments. It definitely needs to take a backseat while gameplay regains control of the wheel in regards to progression. If rivals aren't going to be jerks, they at least need to be more difficult. I think that the rivals from Black and White hit the nail on the head. Bianca acted as the friendly one that helped the player out, while Charon was always more difficult to battle. Going back to this, or the more antagonistic rival archetype, would be a serious upgrade over the rivals from the past three generations. I also think that the gym formula really needs to be shaken up. Raihan has a cool battle because he implements interesting weather strategies instead of just sticking to one type. You shouldn't be able to go into the 7th gym, have a fairy type with a good fairy move in the front of your party, and endlessly spam A to win. Having the first 3 gyms stick to typings to teach players about the game's battle mechanics makes sense, but then having the last 5 be based on interesting strategies like trick room, choice items, or terrains would actually force the player to use their brain and prepare ahead of time to get the upper hand. And implementing the battle frontier found in past games into the post game would allow the player to experience unique and optional challenges where they can use different Pokemon and try out different strategies. On top of all of these changes to the game's sense of progression, Pokemon themselves need to be more integrated into this growth than they currently are. Instead of removing HMs altogether like Sword and Shield try to do, I'd go back to what Sun and Moon did with some twists. As opposed to giving the player ride Pokémon, let them use what they want to without having to teach their Pokémon specific moves. For example, instead of explicitly having to teach a Pokémon Rock Smash, maybe just have it so that any fighting move can break rocks. There's no functional reason as to why Close Combat or Brick Break wouldn't be able to break rocks while Rock Smash can. Maybe the player is only required to have a Pokémon that can swim without having to teach it Surf, and the same with Fly. The presence of the Box Link already removes a lot of this tedium. If you don't want to have a flying type on your team, you can easily pull one out of the box just to put it right back once you're done using it. The Let's Go games actually got this the closest to being perfect by having your partner Pokémon unlock abilities where players would normally receive HMs, so an expansion of this system to include more Pokémon that can learn overworld skills would be great. It would allow the world to breathe and open up, and that progression now ties to the actual Pokémon that you have. Additionally, Pokémon really should follow you. The Isle of Armor DLC has following Pokémon, but, uh... 
Extending the camp feature to be more interactive and unique could really bring out the personalities of the Pokémon even further. What if we could play a rhythm game with Rillaboom, shoot penalties with Cinderace, or have target practice with Inteleon? Instead of gaining the ridiculous buffs of past games, maybe their signature moves gain a little bit more base power, or gain an add-on effect. The Pokémon also need to have more variety in character in the ways you encounter and interact with them in the overworld. Mechanically, what separates a Gengar from a Kamo'o from an Excadrill in the wild area? They all just kinda aimlessly wander around, and chase the player after they're provoked. Pokédex entries provided players with interesting information about the Pokémon that couldn't be shown in the games due to technical limitations. Now that those technical limitations don't exist, however, we should be able to understand and experience the unique personalities and abilities of each Pokémon out in the open. Instead of just seeing an Apom pop out of the ground, we should be able to see one swinging from tree to tree while the player tries to catch it. Instead of having Elgium idly stand around, we could get abducted by a UFO if we're at a specific spot one night, and save other trainers that have been abducted by shutting down the station that's being controlled by Elgiums and Behiums. Instead of showing a Gyarados blandly float around, we should explore the depths of a cavern, slip into a massive body of water at the bottom, just for a Gyarados to jump out and furiously attack the trainer. An extension of this is legendary Pokémon encounters. Although people argue that Gens 4 and 5 had too many legendaries, combined with a more dynamic overworld, these encounters could be incredible spectacles that players would be amazed by. These types of interactions would also massively improve the game's sense of exploration. Players need to feel like they're going on their journey, not going through the exact same motions that every other gamer is being forced into. Having interactions like these, instead of, like, running into everything, would give players memorable, unique, and exciting moments. Another area that requires improvement is the region design. The linearity of Galar seriously impedes on the game's replayability, and harms its sense of adventure. Look at this map of the Galar region, and how you travel in it like a circle. What if instead of entering Motostoke, you emerge from an area right here? Because the first three gyms are set up as the same types as the starter trio, this could allow more inexperienced players to choose a leader that their starter is strong against first, instead of putting players who pick Sobble at an even greater disadvantage. Players looking for a challenge could do the exact opposite and tackle the hardest gym first, but this type of flexibility would require a scaling system. It's shown in the core games, as well as the anime, that leaders have stronger teams than what they initially use against you, so giving them different teams based upon your badge count makes sense. Instead of allowing the 8 gyms to be completed in any order, splitting them up into sections reduces this workload. I think keeping Raihan as the final leader makes sense, so if you keep the first 3 gym leaders together, and then allow the remaining 4 to be completed in any order, you only have to design 26 gym teams, which is less than half of that original number. Furthermore, there needs to be secret areas that the player can uncover, and that content needs to be memorable and meaningful. Some of these areas should be safe for the post-game, so players that are more devoted to the game world feel like they're being rewarded for their investment. Again, this series has a lot of potential, but it's going to require Game Freak, or whoever makes these games, to really push themselves and get creative, instead of repeatedly settling for the bare minimum. In our age of sensationalism, short attention spans, and instant gratification, Pokémon maybe has a formula that's successful. Allowing the player to win all the time and become the champion so easily innately makes them feel better about themselves. In attempting to remove all roadblocks or sources of challenge for the player, however, the games don't have any memorability, mystery, or heart. The ironic thing about instant gratification is that it isn't gratifying at all, and these games have absolutely nothing rewarding beneath the surface. While Pokémon has hit a stride that snugly fits itself within the modern world, it does absolutely nothing to stand out. It's hard to imagine a kid picking up Sword or Shield in the same way I played Pearl as a kid and getting really attached to the series, to the point where they'd be making a 5500 word script trying to express their disappointment that the franchise they once loved has consistently fallen short of their dreams. And I gotta talk about Inteleon. Like, I get what you were trying to do with the Galar starters. You have these three figures that are big in the UK. You have, the, you know, the athlete, the football player, and Cinderace. You have the musician, the drummer, and Rillaboom. And then you have James Bond. Okay, but let's just take a step back. We have a Pokemon based on James Bond. A dude. Dude, look at Inteleon's hands. Look at those hands. Look at them. 
Look at those hands. Those are literally just man hands. There is a man inside of that suit and it is following you around and battling for you. And you have a Pokemon based on James Bond? What happens if you pick the female trainer? Does he just like assault you? We could have had a water dragon serpent Pokemon that was based on the Loch Ness Monster. That would literally be everyone's favorite Pokemon ever. Charizard, Mewtwo, Greninja, move out the way. Here comes Sobble Squad. But no, it's literally just a dude. Like, and what is that pose? Like, what is his tail like curls up? They, they literally maintain nothing from the design. You have this sad, timid little lizard, and then it just turns into a spy. How do those relate? Like, you could have pulled like a Wimpod to Glissopod thing where it goes from like being like really shy to just becoming this like beast, but we don't even get that. It's a spy. Who greenlit this design? Who was like, you know what? I think this is a really great design. I want to see this in my Pokemon game. I think people that pick Sobble are going to be really excited when they realize that their starter Pokemon is James Bond in a furry costume. That's great.